Man, I cannot wait to find out what happened to Luke, Han, and Leia after the return of the Je Episode 1? Episode 1? Does that mean this story's going backwards literally and figuratively? Also, reading. Also, I didn't read any of that shit, let alone comprehend it. A New Hope's first scene, Battle of Vader overtaking Leia's ship. Empire's first scene, Hoth battle. Return of the Jedi's first scene, Tatooine rescue. But this movie's first scene, political ambassadors part of an envoy to talk about trade blockades. Funny, since the days of episode four, which is technically after this movie's events, how much extra technology this era has over its successor. This way, please. When our high-ranking political guests have to walk at the slow-ass pace of a droid like this, maybe we've taken the robot workers concept too far. I have a bad feeling about this. Come with me if you want to live! Also, Liam Neeson isn't killing anyone in this scene. Also, goddammit, this stupid-ass rat tail. I thought various ponytails were for either preventing hair from getting in the way or to be cool. This is neither. Discuss. Be mindful of the living force, young Padawan. The ambassadors are Jedi Knights, I believe. Why would the Chancellor send obvious Jedi to the Trade Federation when it's pretty obvious they would never agree to enter the same room with them? Sending Jedi to something like this is almost like declaring war. At least make them not dress like Jedi so it can be a surprise. Kill them immediately. As you wish. Because killing Jedi is easy. We're on it, boss. Can you send gas to just one room when you feed it into the air conditioning system? Or was this room created by Spectre to execute people you don't like on a whim? They must be dead by now. Destroy what's left of them. Not only does this asshole not wait long enough for the Jedi to be dead, but he also thinks dead Jedi need further destruction. These motherfuckers had these Jedi in here all alone, with pretty much nowhere to go. The room is filled with gas. They have no reason to open this door at all. Even if you think they might lightsaber their way through the door, why not just have your droids waiting to gun them down as they did that? Check it out, Corporal. We'll cover you. Robot soldiers have corporals? Here's your action in a nutshell. Jedi mowing down mindless minions, making a mockery of middling mechanisms. What is going on down there? We lost the transmission, sir. You might be expecting me to send these characters obviously racist accents. And fine, I will. But I'm more interested in seeing how an advanced ship like this could possibly lose all transmission from the affected area. You don't have a backup camera or hallway gear? Why not just do that for the whole army? What did this exactly do anyway? Are they dead? Unconscious? Are we about to see them reboot like all Terminators do? All this destruction and there isn't any smoke, scratch marks, burns, or anything marking a battle took place other than some ruined droids. If you want to know why subconsciously you were hating this movie, it's little details like that. Did someone open a dusty chest where this spare droid was just lying around? Fly, my pretty, fly! They are still coming through! This is impossible! This guy doesn't understand what impossible means. More Jedi. Master, destroy us! This movie suddenly becomes like a video game where the bad guys send new enemies for the hero to fight, but just two of them so the game doesn't get too challenging too fast. Are they watching this footage in the door that was nearly melted by Qui-Gon just a second ago? They've gone up the ventilation shot. Quick, shoot some gas in there! I see they applied Natalie Portman's board makeup. Oh wait, that's not makeup? A communications disruption can mean only one thing. Invasion. What? Do you not know about asteroids and other space anomalies? Are communications always perfect for you assholes? The Senate would revoke their trade franchise, and they'd be finished. You're still talking about this? Why didn't this movie start off with Jedi doing real Jedi thing, with the political theater firmly in the background? Who gives a shit about this stuff? I will not condone a course of action that will lead us to war. But I will condone this hairdo I'm sporting, which surely cost gobs of government dollars, but whatever. I'm guessing in 2019, George Lucas will want to add some more lizards to this shot so that it will finally be complete. <laughs> this is basically Jurassic Avatar. I love you! So look, of course we're going to raise the sin total by a hundred, just because of Jar Jar Binks. But, as we all know, Jar Jar is just a symptom of a far greater evil going on with these movies, blissfully unaware of what makes a positive impact. <laughs> Glad we could see the camera follow this chunk of sprites falling to the ground to add to our enjoyment. I think this movie's discount Dagobah scene was so cheap it might as well be from Spaceballs. Jedi can only go underwater via the help of some they stole from Q at MI6. Wow, you so fine on me now, Rookie Day! Jar Jar is the friendliest Song of the South character of the modern era. Yusa go into the bosses. Yusa in big doo-doo this time. Yusa in big doo-doo this time. You can see it, right? The green screen studio Ewan McGregor and Liam Neeson are standing in? A droid army is about to attack the Naboo. We must warn them. We shall no like the Naboo. Wait, I thought Naboo was the name of the planet. You and the Naboo form a symbiont circle. What happens to one of you will affect the other. You must understand this. It appears that the Gungans and the Naboo are completely separate from each other. These guys live in what is basically a secret underwater city and do fine without one another, so I don't get it. Huh? The speediest way to the Naboo is going through the planet core. This place is basically Earth, right? The planet core isn't going to be ridiculously hot or anything? Okay. Also, the whole reason the clone army came down to Naboo was to fight the people here, but they decided to land on the other side of the planet? Why? Is it so we could see Star Wars turn into Finding Nemo before Finding Nemo existed? He owes me what you call a life debt. Your gods demand that his life belongs to me now. 
I know this because I know everything about your culture I just learned existed five minutes ago. I mean, seriously, he just had this exchange with Obi-Wan. Master, what's a bongo? A transport, I hope. But now he's suddenly an expert on Gungan law. Get the f*** out of here. You know, some folks say Lucas got bogged down in his world creation with the prequels, and those people are onto something and not entirely wrong. This underwater craft built by an underwater civilization has no mechanism for detecting ginormous fish that might be swimming behind it within swallowing distance. 20,000 Jedi under the sea. A big thing that ate a smaller thing gets eaten by an even bigger thing cliche. We're not even 20 minutes in, and these hologram meetings make me want to stab the movie screen with Twizzlers. I had the Senate bogged down in procedures. They will have no choice but to accept your control of the system. Why? You didn't tell him about the missing Jedi. No need to report that to him until we have something to report. And obviously the reigning Sith Lord can't sense Jedi activity on his own, so we're gravy, baby. Where is it going? Don't worry. The Force will guide us. The Force also guided you to nearly getting eaten by a gooberfish just a second ago. Why do we trust this Force anyway? Obi-Wan fixes the ship by playing with a couple of wires. Seems legit. Relax. Qui-Gon waits 20 minutes into this movie to do this. Why are these invading ships attacking in a straight line instead of a super wide front? Viceroy, we have captured the Queen. Ah, victory! Wait, they captured the Queen without a fight? That's not so much a victory as it is a forfeit. Jar Jar's sub containing two Jedi pops up to the surface of a downtown Naboo waterway and no one notices. This is actually fake Queen Amidala, played by Kira Knightley. And this trailing servant is actually Natalie Portman, the real queen, which you only really notice on your second or third viewing. But my question is, what the f*** are you doing watching this a second or third time? I'm curious about many things in this shot. Most importantly, the reason why it looks fake as sh**. These birds are flying to join the birdemic. I'll let you debate which movie is better. You could argue that it's a huge coincidence the two Jedi show up in Naboo at the same time the queen is being whisked away and at the same spot. But someone's just going to show up in the comments schooling you on midichlorians, so why bother? We should leave the street, Your Highness. So absolutely no one from the Federation except a bunch of droids were ensuring the queen got to the right place? They need her to sign a treaty to make this invasion of theirs legal. They can't afford to kill her. What? They need her to sign a treaty to make the invasion of her home planet legal? The movie substitutes the previous robot action scenes in like we won't notice. There's the blockade! One ship is going to attempt to go through a planetary blockade with the Queen in tow. In other news, I just beat LeBron James one-on-one -on -one with one hand tied behind my back, my left shoe tied to my right shoe, and playing with a football when I was on offense. Every droid but R2-D2 gets shot off the surface of the ship like bottles on Kid Rock's fence. R2, though, that f***er is indestructible, of course. And that's saying nothing about these droids' crazy ability to drive on the exterior surface of a moving spaceship. They can't get the shield generator fixed, we'll be sitting ducks! Aren't you all ready? You're right in front of the blockade, with a million ships staring you down. How are they missing you? Deflect the shields up at maximum! So this movie is saying if you have a shield generator, you can easily survive a blockade. Also, once you escape a planetary blockade, no one comes after you. I want that treaty signed. Why does it matter if the treaty gets signed or not? Aren't you evil? Do you care about laws and sh Also, a movie steals the treaty excitement from, um, that one exciting treaty-based movie. I want to know how holograms actually work. Is there a booth you step inside? From the Emperor's perspective, does he see these two guys sitting down as holograms on opposite sides of a table? If so, what at this table is broadcasting them? Also, what's up with this hologram technology? That Darth Maul could be standing a few feet behind his master and not be seen, but step forward and reveal himself. An extremely well put together little droid, your highness. The Queen has time to recognize droid heroism. R2-D2, your highness. Yay, R2-D2! I remember that little guy. I completely forget that the first 28 minutes of this movie was about trade disputes. The hyperdrive generator's gone, Master. We'll need a new one. That'll complicate things. And the screenwriter saw that it was good, and it was good. We're on a stealth mission, so let's bring the slow asteroid and the clumsy court jester Jar Jar. Brilliant! Oh! Just let it go! Fine. Even if this movie is for kids, even if Jar Jar was made for kids, no matter what excuse you give me, this stepping in shit scene is basically a metaphor for the whole franchise. Name one great kids movie that has a scene like this. Go ahead. I'm waiting. Don't touch anything. Hmm. <laughs> Dictionary is unsatisfactory in coming up with the right words of anger for this scene. Are you an angel? Thus began the least believable on-screen romance since Anakin and Padme in Attack of the Clones. Wait. Mm. <laughs> if you subscribe to the brand new and totally insane internet theory that Jar Jar was originally intended to be a Yoda-like evil Jedi master this whole time, how do you explain this Three's Company bull? Credits will do fine. No, they won't! What, you think you're some kind of Jedi waving your hand around like that? This didn't work against Jabba, and it didn't work against this pissant. So if the Force is only good against the weak-minded, what good is it? It should be able to take down some smarter creatures too, if it's worth a damn. Wouldn't have lasted long anyways if I wasn't so good at building things. Character backstory disguised as whining. Is that Greedo in the background? Why can't that motherfucker be shooting his trigger-happy gun right now? When a body meets a body coming through the CGI. Chesco Sebulba. Chipurka Umen Gisa. Aren't you supposed to be cleaning the racks? How did you get out of your child labor obligations to go save Jar Jar? This storm will slow them down. 
Looks pretty bad. It does? I mean, I hear wind sound effects and the picture is a tiny bit blurry, but as a viewer, I've been given no indication of a super serious sudden sandstorm or its severity. We'll head back to our ship. Is it far? Anakin is allowed to walk around with Qui-Gon everywhere he goes now, because he saved the most annoying character in the movie from a fight. How these characters all end up together is hardly organic. Jar Jar does nothing except be oppressed, so they keep him. Anakin saves that asshole, so they keep him. Remember how Luke and Han became a team? It came out of need. These characters get to tag along because the script says so. Come on! I'll take you to my place. Because sandstorms are very, very dangerous, and this sandstorm happened to coincide with a time when the Jedi and company were humoring a little boy tour guide, the rest of all the Star Wars can happen. Isn't he great? He's not finished yet. So, Anakin built C-3PO. Also, the odds of them being in the same narrative by the time A New Hope rolls around are astronomical. I, oh, I don't believe we have been introduced. Movie takes a character introduction that should feel epic and makes it feel... What's the opposite of epic? The death toll is catastrophic. As is this bill I just got for hologram communications. It is absolutely through the roof. We must survive on our own. Jar Jar misses the apple, but he's definitely an asshole. I'm the only human who can do it. You must have Jedi reflexes if you race pods. Pod racing? It's no different from NASCAR or Formula One. The only human who can do it? Just another bullshit explanation for Qui-Gon to recruit this kid into the Jedi Academy. The prize money would more than pay for the parts they need. Basically, Star Wars turned into one of those 80s sitcoms where the characters need $10,000 and they find out there's a dance competition where they can win $10,000. He was meant to help you. Thank God Jar Jar got curious about some bullshit accidentally started a fight with some asshole and Anakin was around to save him, even though I still don't think he cleaned those racks. Hologram budget exceeds 50 million. What if this plan fails, Master? By the way, movie sticks Obi-Wan on this ship, doing nothing, the entire time on Tatooine. That's exactly what we wanted to see the badass character from the original trilogy do, now didn't we? There's something about this boy. Why can't they Jedi talk to each other? Why do they need these little radios? Who was his father? There was no father. Wow, way to Jesus Christ the Anakin character. You know what would have been way more interesting? Almost any mysterious character from the galaxy impregnating you and then leaving. You could have even made that a big surprise reveal in the third movie somehow. Anything but this. Oh no, you okay, Annie. <laughs> Quiet, baby Greedo. You're lucky we even let you hold the paddle. This movie has officially come to a dead stop. What's happened so far? 28 minutes about taxes and another 15 minutes or so of the brown bunny when we watch Vincent Gallo wash his car in real time. 35 second long conversation about midichlorians is 36 seconds too long. I need a midichlorian count. Hey, remember when you watched the original trilogy and you thought, man, if I could believe in the Force, I could be a Jedi. Well, turns out Jedi creation depends on whether or not you have a lot of something really dumb called midichlorians in your bloodstream. How does an evil ship with a Sith Lord on it land on this planet without radar or Jedi intuition picking it up? As usual in these movies, only the bad guys have autonomous probes. I'll wager my new racing pod against, say, the boy and his mother. Oh, I see. Qui-Gon either knows for a fact that Anakin will win the race, or he's literally risking everything on a hunch. Either way, sit. Qui-Gon practices the Jedi way and cheats at the dice throw. Shit, he should just use his Jedi powers to sabotage the race if he's gonna subvert honesty anyway. I can assure you they will never get me onto one of those dreadful starships. Wah, wah. I love how strange evil flying drones are able to wander this planet without anyone thinking it's weird or shady. The first Star Wars accomplished and established more in 20 minutes than this movie has in an hour. <laughs> Sure, why not? Here's a hundred cents. Sebulba sabotages Anakin's pod racer in front of thousands of spectators, yet no one sees a thing.